Hey, this is Candia Raquel, founder of Centro de Poder, and you are at the Sensual Sessions podcast, the place to experience sensing pleasure through your senses and expressing yourself completely free from inhibition through movement. And there's a link below with a gift, shall you wish to get yourself so surprised. And today we have a very special guest. This is Sonia Johansson. Welcome, Sonia. Such a pleasure to have you here. Thank you, Candia. We were having such a good conversation. We thought we better let everybody else in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like let, let's continue live. So we we were talking about our backgrounds as Pilates movers and how yeah. our career started partly um, in delight for movement, but partly accidentally. So do you remember how did you began your your quest for for knowing more about awareness and conscious movement? Yeah, yeah. I I um there were two really pivotal moments and one was very, very early and I was saying, you know, with COVID and the decisions we had to make um, about reformatting our career, our career up to that point might have been about luck, chance, accident, you know, good accidents. But I, as a child, I was very, very shy and I grew up in a fairly chilly environment, I would say, like in terms of emotional connection with family and it, it looking back I realized I wasn't just timid I wasn't just shy I was practically invisible I was so quiet and um yeah my my mother was an immigrant immigrant family single mother she was working very very hard after a pretty ugly divorce and you know just you know working away at a menial job and saving her pennies and she felt like she was a huge disappointment to her family and um she had a sense of unworthiness that sort of just got passed on to me so i was lucky that i i was sent to ballet class maybe at the age of five and a whole new world what opened up it was a pretty you know nondescript big cavernous town hall you know the ones just wooden uh, walls and um, nothing very interesting, very drafty. But I was um, sent to those ballet classes and it gave me an opportunity to kind of move and um, express because it was a kid, you know, we were doing some amount of technique, but I actually met friends, I met people and I had new experiences that you know, I've got, I've still got some of these friendships from that time. So that was like the first time I was doing sort of formal movement. Um, and then I was lucky at um, my fifth and seventh grade, I had exactly the same teacher, Mr. Smith. I'm not kidding. Mr. John Smith was his name. Tall, square jawed, um, slicked hair, very jovial, deep laugh. And, um, very inspiring, always a glint in his eye. And he he really encouraged critical thinking. He also was quite, you know, he would meld the, the lessons together. There was all, always drawing inside math class. And then there was always, you know, some kind of move, you know, it was like a very, cause you know, in grade school, primary school, you have the same teacher from nine until three or whatever it is. And a lot of storytelling. So the drawing and the storytelling and, um, he taught me the value, as I said, of critical thinking and a kind of self-worth. So those ballet classes kind of helped me to experience myself in a more physical way. And then um, then I was a graduated high school with pretty bad grades, partly because I was going through a rebellious part of my life. And, and you know the term, I, I threw my exams. I basically went, I don't care. This is, you don't understand the establishment. You don't understand me. And I just ended up with really terrible grades. <laughs> Luckily, I could dance. So I auditioned for the, um, the dance college. So there was a three-year program. Uh, some people might have heard of the West Australian Academy of Performing Arts, or WAPA, as it's known. So um, that was another 
another opportunity to really get more embodied. There was a lot of uh, restriction too, because there was classical training, there was contemporary dance. We thankfully had um, live musicians and we would, we also expl explored um, traditional dance forms. So uh, Indian, Spanish, um, Balinese. So these were very grounding, flamenco. And um, it was at some point that my dance teachers, especially when it came to choreography class where you had to perform your own work, they were like, you talk too much. There's too much language. There's too much speaking in your dancing. Go to the theatre department. So that's where I <laughs> auditioned for the theatre department. And um, that, was, that was also like my real opportunity to open my mouth and be heard. And um, I, I realised sort of a little bit in hindsight because acting, I thought, and performance, the stage was about the way the Greeks, the ancient Greeks, it was about um, a didactic. If it was, I thought it was about the ability or the, the capacity to change the world, to make an audience, to help an audience think about themselves, think about their lives and come out of that theatre transformed. Now, if you look at television, if you look at movies, if you look at theatre, there are some, you know, examples awesome. where that happens and they're amazing, but generally it's not like that. And that's where I was really lucky. I was introduced to um, the Feldenkrais method that we both awesome. have trained and Pilates that we have both trained. And um, I came to realise that the way I was going to help people transform their lives was Feldenkrais. So I went back and did a Feldenkrais training. And also there was a bit of conflict in my mind about where Pilates and Feldenkrais, can you, can they live together? Can they be roommates? Can they sleep in the same <laughs> bed? <laughs> <laughs> so that took me a long, long while to make peace because, I, you know, I, I tried to be, um, um, have a stringent argument like stand on this side of the fence and argue your peace for organic, functional, free, easy, light movement, go stand in the Pilates camp and tell me all the great things about that. You know, it's like debate team, you know, stand on both sides. So that's a little bit about how I got to where I am. And um, there's more yeah. besides. The, there's a lot to, you, to your journey and your story because what I'm getting is that the, the, feel, the feeling of unworthiness that strangely enough came as an interpretation of what actually was was a story of courage and dignity for an Im immigrant divorced junk mother so, but like the environment led to, to that interpretation of unworthiness that was passed by to you and that you felt not only shy but invisible but <laughs> like you went from from shyness to <laughs> throwing away the, the exams um, yeah that was that was my power like yeah. you know and wow you know it really smacked me in the face didn't it so um, yeah but like uh, as he, as he's as if everything was like a couple of bad grades and then from dancing to theater so what happened in between was movement was mm. your first classes of dancing and then this uh, unique presence at the key moment of your story of this John Smith. Yes, that was <laughs> Easy, a, right? <laughs> a, a unique person, a unique character. And, and yeah, in that journey is actually what is at the core of of the journeys that we motivate with Pilates, with Feldenkrais, with with movement, that is that the person get to know more about themselves, but not not only on a discursive level or at the level of the credentials that you have or at the level of your accomplishments at work or money or how many boyfriends you have declined or whatever, but <laughs> that you get the sense of yourself through sensing who you are. And then like 
then you can stand on, on your two feet. Then you can come forth in the world as you are, first and foremost. And then you, if you qualify or if you are disqualified, well, then you are just ranked according to an external criteria that will never compromise your your sense of dignity or the way that, that you stand for yourself. And for me, that's fascinating because like given given the proper conditions, I've seen like almost miracles with my with my students. Like, wow, now now I can see you and now you can feel yourself because that's you. I mean you were you you were always you, but that was the you that was walled off protecting from pro, yeah in protection from mm, from mm, past mm. experiences and everything mm. and now this is you like like a flower that has a, the space to to open and and bloom that is what flowers and plants do they they do their mm. thing they 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 thrive and i can see that happening in I feel in every in every approach that has at the core um, the awareness of the self in a fleshed sense way, not in the blah blah blah. Let's let's become more spiritual than the other studio, and mm -hmm, because mm -hmm. we we are striving to have less ego than them. <laughs> No, that that's only worse. It's very common. It's happening a lot. I mean, in you know, the, the good and the bad is that more and more people are meditating. That's good. And bad. <laughs> the bad is like, um, well, I know that I, I got more seriously into meditation during the pandemic, and I've been lucky that I have a meditation group that's led by a monk. So there's all the sitting in silence, but then there's no wisdom around what do you do with those thoughts? Why are we sitting in silence? You know, because it's very nice to calm your mind. It's very nice to be relaxed and all that kind of thing. But ultimately, it's about being connected to the universe. And out of that has to come kindness. So as you sit there suffering, your next action needs to be to ease someone else's suffering. And not because it's transactional, because of karma, which is also like a concept that, um, I've heard on more than one occasion the word being used as a as a a weapon. As a weapon, well, karma yeah. will get you. Like, what do yeah, you think? like like sin, like very Catholic. Yeah, yeah. that's not original at, at all. That that's like a yeah, like like in everything. Like it's very easy to get derail, derailed mm. by the narratives and and discourses of beliefs, while. I feel that most of of this body mind um, knowledge has the same aim of just like remember that you are alive here now and that's it and and that's it for so long so you better do something about it and for a short time so long like, yeah yeah, when yeah, you yeah. Arrive right right in, into you like then you can go to to spread the good vibes and 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 everything into the world but also like uh something that i like a lot both of Feldenk from feldenkrais and and from pilates is that i feel that those are trainings for life like those two guys <laughs> discovered the way to survive war and not only to survive but to make amazing methods out of mm. that horrible experiences so like really like if it doesn't kill you it makes you stronger mm -hmm, mm -hmm. it's not like it's not that easy it's i feel it's w what they got to to process and integrate in their selves and what they got to bear as unnecessary as fluff as as just narrative and they like shared this because of course if you if you live on a monastery and all you do is meditate and maybe watch the 
the dishes some days, other di days, mm -hmm. do the laundry. Like, yeah, it takes a lot of discipline, but but spiritual <laughs> development on a monastery or on a specialized um, environment. Like a retreat. Like a retreat. Take away, takes away two important factors. One is money <laughs> and the mm -hmm. other is sex and relations and just without those two distractions in life <laughs> like how wouldn't you reach enlightenment and what i like a lot of of embodied approaches is that those are not for a perfect condition laugh of of stillness those are made like from guys that were in war <laughs> yeah so, living in an internment camp, sleeping on the beach. I mean, not in yeah. a fun way. Had not no in a fun did. way. Sleep in a tent on the beach. Yeah, yeah. Not not knowing if you're going to wake up. <laughs> so, like, we were talking about how we've rebuilt our professional lives in a way during during the pandemic. And for me, like, there were not only hours, days, weeks but actually those were months of really not knowing absolutely anything of like living in absolute uncertainty because like <laughs> i remember what like <laughs> sneaking out of my house at five in the morning with my dog and my skates because i said like how come i am not gonna go skating with no cars in the biggest cities of Mexico City. It was deserted. But other than those shenanigans, I mean, there were like sustained periods of existential angst. And mm -hmm. then I tried to think myself out of it. And I tried to like, uh, yeah like keep positive and do my affirmations and everything and i can say like now <laughs> from the other side that now i live on completely another place and i work on a different thing and everything i can say that what kept me literally alive during the pandemic like and like emotionally able to just keep on going forward was not what I did on that moment, but all the the body mind work and and the physicality that I built over decades, like the momentum that I had, kept me going in in a radical life or death situation that took away a lot of people that I knew and that was tragical for like all of us in small or, or bigger ways so i feel that yeah it's it's important um the sense of of the self like to simply like even in a childish and naive way like just sense yourself be alive and in the end that's all you have i mean you probably still have your shoes and your phone and you know if someone said three two one leave your house and don't look back what do you have and as we we're talking about moshe feldenkrais and joseph pilates in a way you know the refugee story is 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 their story and i mean i was lucky and know how lucky you were i got to flee a city that was in pandemic but i got to do it with two suitcases and not with just a backpack and whatever I could take. But, um, you know, that's extreme and, and not everyone's going to go through that. But I think there are there are little deaths every day. You know, I mean, there are little tragedies every day. And the, the, the movement practices I was doing and you were doing helped you come back to, you know, you didn't have to pretend, especially if you're at home alone, you didn't have to pretend. I mean... There were days, I'm sure you had them, where, um, you know, just crying or didn't want to get out of bed. There were, yeah, so those moments of deep despair and how do you come back from that? How do you find hope? How do you find the will to live? 
again, it all sounds very dramatic, but, you know, if you keep soldiering on, which is the other side of the story, because it's expected of you, because you have a job or you have a family or you have these this role you play, you're also deadening that part of yourself and um, it might serve you quite well, but you have to keep that arrangement of the detachment of your brain and your body. So that's a, what is it? Um, uh, that's a contract you have to make and you've got to stick to it and it's kind of exhausting. And what happens, and I'm talking about this disconnect but that people, and a lot of people have either their whole lives or for short periods of time, that they, their physical body, their sensation of themselves, they tune it out or they turn it off. It, it doesn't go away. It is always there. Close your eyes. You can't see. Your sight didn't go away, but actually there's nothing to see except for a bit of flashing. Now, tune out from your physical sense. Do it. Listeners, viewers, do it. Do it now. You actually can't do it. Okay, if you had a general anesthetic or local anesthetic to some part of your body, that's how you can do it. But there is a price to pay when you do that disconnect, which is as you get older, if you're lucky enough to get older, your body is going to start sending you messages, just like your car is sending you a message. Hey, you're running low on fuel. There's no more oil. Your brake lights don't work. And their messages are just going, 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 and you're not paying any attention. It will lead to bad things. So <laughs> there's this culture in the West or however you want to think of it, sophisticated society, no pain, no gain. Children are taught it very early and boys, Boys are taught it still, you know, toughen up, young man, no tears. And that ability to, to disconnect from your physical state is an ability to disconnect from, your, disconnect from your emotional state. So in the end, you know, our senses, you know, because you're talking about the sensory podcast and we think of five senses. I'm sure your presenters have you know, seeing, hearing, tasting, smelling, and touch. And then those two really important ones that are always left off the list, vestibular, your inner ear, yeah. which if you ever have an inner ear infection, you get vertigo, your life is hell. And proprioception, it's a bit of an interesting word. Many people actually haven't heard it. I'm kind of surprised. But proprioception is your physical sense of where you are in space, whether you're moving, it just how your joints or how your muscles sort of interact with your brain. But I think fundamentally that many of those individual senses, I'm thinking like sight, you could tell me if you think I'm right, I was thinking about, you can't have a physical sensation without emotion. I don't mean, mm. ah, or ooh. Ah, there is a, a certain level of um, emotive state with every physical sensation because it was our first language. If, when you're an infant and you arrived out of your mother, sorry, kids, that's how babies arrive, um, all you had was your physical sense of your skin and you ate and you pooped and you wriggled and you got bathed and hopefully you got hugged and all that kind of stuff. and that communicated to you. You didn't need words. You didn't need a lullaby. You didn't need hearing. So I think some of our senses are kind of um, clear or, or without uh, emotion. Like I could show you a dot. I don't know. Here you go, a dot. Whatever. Okay, it's green. I don't. I don't know. Whatever. But it, it somehow doesn't have that immediate immediacy of emotion because emotion essentially is a physical sensation yes. because it exists somewhere down your central line in your guts in your throat in your chest could be up here could be up in your nose yeah that's that's all your emotion right yes yes we have more than five senses and in a way these yeah, are many like many more proprioception i i it's like proprio like your property perception perception so Proprioception. Yeah, yeah. Proprio to oneself. Yeah. Gives us like a, 
a great feeling of ourselves. Like I remember when I was growing up, like I we will like I don't know 10 centimeters in three months or something like brutal. Like they had to to buy me a whole new wardrobe, and I remember that suddenly the this thing sink to wash my hands was like almost to the floor. Like I felt like like Alice in Wonderland when she doesn't fit the house and she's almost crashing <laughs> to the ceiling. And I, I, I was all bruised because I was crashing everywhere because um, my sense of self at, a, at the sense of the proprioception was not adjusted. Like I really couldn't tell <laughs> where my body started or ended. So I was like super mega clumsy. And this is pretty mm. much left out. Like, like, like you say, we are educated to wall off from from our senses, and especially from the experience that we get through the raw perception that comes from from our senses, as if that was the formula for toughening up. But the truth is that the least sensitive you become, the least able you are to adapt to a changing environment, say war, like in war or in the, the pandemic, everything changed. And what, what required what, like to not be so damaged from the experience was like to in the middle of the worst moment, invent the best solutions available to you. And that is very hard to do if, if you are not sensing, not feeling, or worst, if, if you are repressing your emotions. Mm -hmm. if you're, just... you're using two lots of energy, the energy of the emotion and like um, a beach ball trying to push it under the water. It keeps, it keeps coming up. It keeps coming up. And then heart attack and like a lot of people passed away not from COVID but from chronic degenerative diseases that just got triggered because obviously people got scared out of the pandemic situation cortisol levels rise immune system lowered and like the, the inner biology physiology whatever got just completely distorted and yeah like Coming back to to the aspect of how to <laughs> how to not integrate Feldenkrais and Pilates, but like how to how to work with those methods without them like getting jealous, fighting, etc. Oh, <laughs> I I actually I've made a hybrid during the COVID. They got together and they made a baby. They slept in the same bed. It's going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> loving it they, they made a baby tell yeah us, yeah tell us about so, the baby let, i'll tell you about the baby so firstly you have to understand my two opposing arguments which is if you don't already know what the feldenkrais method is you're not alone it happens to be sensory motor so your physical sense of your body and your ability to move and those parts of your brain improving those that that the way they interact with one another and essentially what we're looking to do in the feldenkrais method whether you're having a private session or if you're doing a group class is we want to improve function now function is a word that's a bit fashionable in the fitness world but really function is the movements that go to make up everyday life so function is about actions with outcome so this is not an action with outcome. It was just raising my arm up and down. Sorry if you're listening. Sorry if you're listening to the, <laughs> the recording. Sorry, I was just lifting my arm up and down. Yeah. Um, so a functional movement, a Feldenkrais class, doesn't look like an exercise class. It looks like a a child exploring movement. Now everyone is given a parameter if it's a group class on what they're exploring. It's not just a free for all. It's not like a giant game of Twister where everyone has their own separate spinning wheel although sometimes it looks like that and i think that's the skill set of a feldenkrais practitioner is you have to be very comfortable with everybody in the room doing something a little bit different 
And you've got to know the moment when it's time to bring them all together again, give it a little bit more instruction. But I, I digress. Anyway, Feldenkrais, I think, is wonderful. I mean, I cannot tell you how amazing I believe it to be both personally and for the people that I work with. And it's mainly hands-on and it's the kind of touch that is so gentle and so um, nurturing that really there's nothing quite like it. Sometimes you feel it in craniosacral, sometimes an osteopath have that kind of touch, but it's a full body experience. So then you have Pilates. Now, I love Pilates because I do Pilates. I have a reformer, not a big one, not like, not like you. Um, sorry, I have, yeah, you have a Cadillac reformer hidden in there, but mine's in the closet. But one of the things that actually kind of repels me about Pilates, if I can be quite frank with you, is it's it's somewhat robotic, is that much of the movement is done on straight lines, very visibly of what we call cardinal or planar lines. And anyone who studies anatomy knows that there is no straight bone in the body. You might think your thigh bone is straight. It is not. It is it's not. bowed like one of those artificial limbs. Your, even your fingers have a little bend in them. There's no joint surface in your body that is flat or perfectly round for that matter. So it's kind of preposterous to think that there are movements that the body does that are straight or cardinal or, you know, forward, back or whatever. So I find those sorts of things about Pilates frustrating. It has to be a fairly sophisticated and inspired teacher to, to make sessions that really look like human movement, like I was saying, functional movement. And the other thing that kind of bugs me about Pilates is that it's kind of expected that that you're equal, that you're even, that you're symmetrical, because you would do 10 movements on this side and 10 on that side. And I know, because I've worked with hundreds of hundreds, hundreds, hundreds of people, like hundreds of people, that there are very few people who are perfectly matched left and right. I've met, I've met one, I've met a young woman who was a competitive diver. Wow. And she was almost perfectly symmetrical. I worked with her and I did a lot of um, assessment around that and what was really interesting about her is that if she had to do something like kick a ball or catch a ball there was always a moment of delay because she would have the possibility of doing it with either side and that really screwed her up actually for, for that activity sports yeah. let's say so um, the syllabus in Pilates assumes that you're symmetrical and here's the tricky thing on a Cadillac, I don't know if you know, sorry, on a reformer, I'm getting my machines, with the springs. Yes. Springs actually hide your asymmetries. Yes. Your stronger arm is going to pull and make up the dis difference that your weaker arm does. Yeah, so it's so going to yeah. become even more strong. Yes. As we say, you know, it's um, the, the, the strong get stronger, the weak get weaker. You make a stronger version of your crooked self. So for me, that's the, the problem with Pilates and there tends to be less twist rotation, which is a highly evolved human activity than we see, let's say in the Feldenkrais method. So I created a hybrid and in a funny way, the, the tragedy of the pandemic put me in a situation, the way it came about is this, I've been talking a long time and I've been sort of toying around creating Feldenkrais Pilates on a roller or you know doing a little Feldenkrais to prepare you to do a, you know a full uh, traditional Pilates class but I it was never a, it was never a melding it was never a true fusion so I think it was like maybe two weeks into the pandemic and I was teaching online I just even the I was working with some big organizations and they didn't pivot very fast you know, the day I remember March 13, and the next day I woke up and went, okay, I teach online now. I don't know what that means. I don't know how to do it, but I teach online now. <laughs> I just went. And, um, and then I also realized that I was getting really depressed. Like you know, I was getting scared living in New York city. We were getting news stories. You would walk outside. The city had shut down other things were happening. We were living under a certain government that was horrific. And um, there were also the, the riots that were happening, Black Lives Matter. It was, it was a really crazy time. Like you look back right. and you go, 
was that a TV show? No, that was that was us. Um, you know, there was looting. You were talking about, you know, <laughs> there's no Starbucks in your neighborhood. Like the Victoria's Secret was looted. It doesn't make any sense. Like knickers? It's the end of days. Why are you stealing knickers? But whatever. Um, exactly. So the, I, that's how it felt. The yeah, end it of did, days. It did, didn't it? Yeah. And um, I think we're a bit sensitive. So we went a little bit like our brains went, okay, if this is happening now, What's going to happen in, I mean, maybe it was like that for you. So going back to those moments, I went, okay, if I let this feeling, you know, I don't want to hide this feeling, but if I let it overwhelm me, I won't get out of bed and I will just stay here and, I don't know, cry or whatever. The other thing that happened, I think this is rather amusing. Sorry if my sister is listening. The, the few weeks leading up to when we really shut down, we were watching the news and the stories about, you know, people flying in from Milan and people flying in from China and we're getting these stories about something happening in China. I was talking to my sister. She lives in Australia and in Western Australia, which is where I grew up, which is the most isolated city in the world, literally and figuratively. And I said to her, you know, I'm, this thing is about to happen, kind of global, and I'm a bit worried. And, you know, maybe I should just get on a plane and maybe, maybe I should just hang out with you guys. She's got three kids. It'd be great to hang out with the kids, you know, got grandparents and so, so on. She said, no, don't come. Oh, it's a mm, bacteria or a virus or something. Don't come. I went, uh, 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 okay, yeah, all right. All right. Uh, well, uh, talk to you next week. Bye. One week later, she's on the phone. Oh my God, you're going to die and it's my fault. Sorry. You're going to die, it's my fault. Yeah. I didn't die, don't worry. Um, oh, so you, you invented a new baby. I did I'm invent a new baby, so I worked really action. hard and I, I made a pack with myself. I, I put on the calendar, on my Zoom calendar, on my teaching calendar, 9 a.m., Monday to Friday, 20 minute class. Who wants to come? I wake up seven o'clock. I get ready for the class. I teach it. I was teaching it while I was on the road. I was in Caribbean. I was in Sweden. I was in, I was on the road. I just kept teaching it. I've been teaching it. Doesn't matter what time of day it is in oh, 9 a.m. New York. Better start teaching. And I, I developed a, a fitness. It's really fitness because it's really about strength. And it incorporates the principles of the Feldenkrais method. So we start always from the, the framework of sensing oneself, recognizing that there is the better, not great language, I'm sorry, but there's a good side and a bad side. It's not good and bad. There's one side that's doing okay and the other side that needs a little more of your attention, needs a little bit more tender, loving care. So that's how we do the class. There's a lot of um, strength work in the form of isometric. So most people don't have a reformer. They barely have stretchy bands. So I was using anything from a towel, a scarf, um, whatever you had in the home, a pencil. We yeah. were gonna use that. You got a chair, great. You got a wall, we're good to go. And this, uh, the, the patterning, if you like, the, the choreography comes from the Feldenkrais method. So for me, I'm quite proud and I'm an Australian and we're not really proud of anything. We don't like to be, be upstanding and, and uh, you know, ring our own bell. Uh, we have something called the tall poppy syndrome, which is if someone sticks their head up because they've made an achievement, we say, pull your head in. Yeah. Pull your head in, it's like... Yeah, pull your head in, like... Like yeah, a snail or like a turtle. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. But literally, you have to pull your head down or someone will chop it off. Anyway, um, in words, not in natural, actual fact. So this has been uh, a practice. It's, it's, um, it's, a, it's like the muse takes me, just like you. I've been teaching Pilates for more than 20 years. Feldenkrais I've been doing also, teaching it for more than 20 years. So in a way, I let those two kind of pass through each other and keep with these strict rules. People, people, my students, you must always use your sense of comfort as a guide. Yes. It doesn't feel good, Yes. back off. You know, 
the amount of effort you use is like the amount of salt you use. One yeah. grain of salt is still salt. A handful is still salt. So just that idea of it's always moderated, modulated to where you are at. Lots of um, different positions that can be modified with a little bit of um, padding. Um, using, as I was saying, PNF. Some people know this as more like isometric, but isometric on diagonals. And it's been great. I mean, some of the feedback I've been getting is kind of astounding. One of them particularly sort of stopped me in my tracks. One of my students has been coming for a very long time, I would say maybe since the beginning. And um, she's been living with a neurological condition. And usually she would, for this condition, you would have a medication. And she's been able to be off that medication now for several years. And she went to see her neurologist and her neurologist said, you're doing great. Like you're actually doing really well. Like you're getting better with no medication. And, and of course, the, the doctor asked her what she'd been doing. She's talked about my class and she kind of puts it down to the class, which is another element of this neurological element of function. So the movements we do, again and they don't look much like a calisthenic or a fitness class because they're not it's it's a strength fitness but with awareness and like you say it's honest exercise yeah like something that shocked me from from pilates when when i was preparing for teaching the first module of the teacher training was like i i wrote down all the exercises of the repertoire and then i marked all that were in the sagittal plane one of the three cardinal planes that you mentioned <laughs> and and from there like okay sagittal it's like you bend forward in an abdominal crunch say or you bend backwards in an extension okay so let's let's see how many exercises for the abdominals and flexions are and how many for the extension and it was like it was like 90% exercises for the abdominals and and only the swan and the swimming and the swan dive for for the back that are super yeah yeah that for. and it's like this yeah, is they're very I, difficult this yeah. is why I was like how how am i so of course my 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 students were like kind of um i would say persuaded to not say forced or manipulated <laughs> into introducing like one extension position or exercise or something whatever in the middle of of all that uh flexions and the same for lateral bends and and for twists and the thing is that I like Pilates a lot for the same reason that I dislike it. <laughs> that is this rigid uniplanar movement. Like you're either moving sideways mm -hmm. or back and forth or twisting. Like there, there are a few combinations, very pleasurable, pleasant combinations. Mm -hmm. But really, those are more more like like an exception and. It helped me a great deal with my clumsiness because I started from the very basic of like <laughs> Candia, the focus on what's what's your right hand from your left hand and only move the right hand and now the left hand in a very clear di direction. Mm -hmm. And in Feldenkrais, my my first experience was was a uh, a kind of two week retreats that drive me crazy because <laughs> I was training high level. I was dancing professionally. So on the third day, after the sixth hour in the afternoon, I was really going crazy, just lying on the floor, pushing the wall because we were, it was a bones for life training. Ah. Actually, yeah, a, class, a wonderful teacher. An experience. Yeah. Ruth, Ruth yeah. Allen, yeah. But not with Ruthie Allen, with with uh -huh. Deborah Lotto. She's she's great. I yeah. I also got to only to communicate a little bit with with Ruthie. 
But yeah, like in the beginning, it it was like, when is the warm up going to start? Like I was not not even asking for for the real deal. I I was asking just for the warm up because I was so lost mm -hmm, mm -hmm. in the midst mm. of my numbness, the one that you yeah, made, yeah. That were taught like. You, you need to toughen up, young boy. And as a woman, like, my grandmother was Dutch, and she she came, like, she she was the hero of, of the family. But, like, yeah, and she was very connected to her body, but her, her temperament was super tough, and I interpreted that as... Um, disassociating from my body and my sensations that has had to do with the clumsiness and also with a pervading aloofness mm -hmm. so yeah in the beginning like really it was i think maybe one if not the most confronting experience in my life like like almost as sitting in front of the mirror looking at yourself for two weeks and like yeah like <laughs> you don't get to to tilt your your head or to look to a, to a, another no, i didn't say that i said just leave it still yeah 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 and as a teacher was... it's very you can become the master it's a very tricky thing and when i teach all my classes whether it's a fitness class or a feldenkrais pure class I, I literally say it is an invitation. I am inviting you yes. to lie down. If yeah. you wish, move yourself. If you could be in stillness, because it's it can be some people also, as as we know from training and dance, is that you want to be a good student, you want to be a good dancer, is you want to do what the teacher says. And that's another way we cut ourselves off. And I feel yes. that dance in a professional way is also another means by which we become disassociated but i i, I do want to yeah i you know i have a little little movement lesson for us yeah can you show it shall we, shall we yeah Let's so see. um i i prepared a little something because of course i'm sure your other presenters have given them given your audience a taste of their somatic practices whatever and there's so much that we can, can we can do on the floor and of course if you want to try one of my floor-based lessons you can go to my website and there's a, a button you can click but i thought what we'd do is do something sitting because it's easy most people are probably sitting or watching this or listening to this and what you're going to need for this is a chair like a regular chair at your dining table or if you're sitting at your desk right now on your computer that would be great because what I would like you to have and I, I can't show you because my computer's going to be in the way is I want you to be able to sit so that that I don't know desk or your table is right there because when we when we continue we're going to start to do things like rest our head in our hands so whatever situation you want to set up I've actually put um, a towel because maybe your elbows are going to get a little sore if you were to lean on your um, table surface or your desk or something like that so that's what you need for this but we're going to start somewhat um, simply but as we know from your description of having to spend two torturous weeks just watching yourself observing yourself if you want to join us in this little exploration, just come and sit to the front of your seat. Sit upright, but not stiffly. Sit so that your back isn't touching the backrest. If you're on a stool, well, you don't have an option. And just notice how, how much work, how much effort does it take to sit like this? There are, you know, as I was mentioning, yo uh, yoga, Pilates, I can't get my Pilates, my yoga and my meditation. They're all becoming one meditation is becoming very popular and if you want to do it perfectly you're supposed to have a perfectly upright back or whatever but of course you know you're gonna you're gonna sag so just notice where your muscles are having to engage to keep your head upright to keep your your you know your spine how do you think of it neutral whatever your pelvis whatever part of your bottom is touching your chair just notice that sensation maybe it's nice to wiggle a little bit that's great and if you happen to be looking 
at your screen right now, I want you to imagine that your screen, your computers, they just disappear, disappear. And what would you see? Because there's probably a wall on the other side of the room. And it really, I'm asking you about what orientation is your head? Are you a little bit turned off to the right or are you looking down a little bit? Now, if you're sitting really close to your table or your desk, you're going to have to move the chair backward because the next thing I'm going to ask you to do is rise. That means stand up. So if you can stand, go ahead and stand, come to your feet and then go and sit back down again. Yeah, you might have to turn your chair or turn yourself. So what you just did is a squat. Did you know that? Now, in the fitness world, they think of they say squat is when your your knees are deeply folded and your bottom is about a three inches from the floor. That's a full squat. But to do a good um, efficient squat, you have to be able to lower yourself into a chair uh, with some degree of comfort and control. So can you do that again? Can you stand up? Just come on to two straight legs. And this time, when you lower yourself, don't land. I mean, descend, descend, descend. You have to be bending your knees, probably your hip joints and your ankles as well. And can you feel that moment where the, 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 the effort gets really hard? Like if I said, hover there with your bottom above the seat. Ladies, you know how it is when you go to public restroom. You don't want to put your bottom on the, you know what I'm talking about, right? So now what we're going to do is a little bit of a somatic exploration, a little awareness through movement, as we call it in the Feldenkrais method. And here is where you're going to need to have that surface. So what I want you to do now is just play around with different ways of resting your head in your hands. So you might be having your forehead resting you know, in the palm of your hands, maybe you're covering your eyes, maybe your hands, the little fingers are almost touching. Maybe, yes, I see that you've got your, um, the heel of your hand, your cheekbones, whatever feels like, yeah, my arms are doing some of the work that my spine was doing a moment ago, which is holding my head up. How does that feel? Is it a bit claustrophobic? Sorry if you've got makeup on because it's going to end up in your hands. <laughs> Sorry about that. But as you're getting cozy with this position, you could even separate your feet a little bit, move your bottom back on the chair, whatever it takes to be able to feel at ease in this arrangement. I grew up in a very hot country and in the summertime when we were at school, my school rooms didn't have air conditioning at the time. Yes, I'm that old. And the teachers knew that we were really, you know, exhausted. And they said, oh, just put your head on the desk and have a sleep. So now your, your hands are supporting your head like this. And can you feel, can you sense your eyeballs? Your eyeballs in their sockets, I know you know that they're round, but can you feel, can you experience somehow sensorially that your eyeballs are round or is this just a concept? And as you're hanging out, quite literally the weight of your head resting kind of like an egg in the egg cup that your hands are making and your forearms, a little, little support for your head, which I feels fuller, which eye feels more round. Maybe one eye feels rather still, one eye quiet, the other eye seemingly busy or moving a little bit. And which eye feels like it's sinking, sinking in the line of gravity. What does that mean? It means your eyes would be falling forward. Now at any time you can come off your hands. We're just going to continue exploring, noticing sensations, and eventually we'll be doing some movement in this position, your arms, your hands, your elbows, your forearms supporting the weight of your head. So come out of it and come back whenever you like. And when you're once again supporting the weight of your head with your arms like this, can you now notice your tongue? Your tongue is in your mouth. Your mouth is a cavern. And where is your tongue hanging out? Where is it resting? Is there some part of your tongue touching the roof of your mouth, the top of the inside of the chamber of your mouth? 
is some part of your tongue touching the back of your teeth. Are your lips parted? Is your mouth closed? You'll notice that I'm asking a lot of questions. I'm not saying do this, make it so. I'm simply saying what is it about this present moment of how you are in space that you can actually um, notice, assess, be aware of? And what's the shape of your tongue? I mean, you've probably seen it in anatomical drawings. Maybe you've poked your tongue out and looked at it in the mirror. But at this moment, with your tongue inside your mouth, does your tongue feel tight, bound? Maybe it feels like toward the tip, it's somewhat sharp, angled. Or is it loose? Is it fulsome? Is it like an overstuffed? pillow your tongue now we're going to do a bit of imagery and imagery work ideokinesis and other work visualization that also we do in the feldenkrais method you're going to imagine that your tongue is like a water balloon a water balloon hangs heavy can you allow at least some part of your tongue to kind of lean up against the back of your teeth. Imagine droplets of rain falling from above and filling up, swelling up the fulsomeness, the size of your tongue. Maybe you could think of an awning, a uh, canvas awning being filled with rain. And then just let your tongue gently slide a little bit maybe only one tooth length width to the side and then across to the other side you might imagine that you're mm, uh, lapping the water or you're on a boat on a quiet sea and just let the weight of your tongue kind of drift a little side to side and as you do that can you notice what your eyes are doing are your eyes also swaying drifting side to side very nice come come sit up for a moment if you haven't already had a chance just sit you can sit tall as you like you can lean back in the seat as you like but make a soft fist with one of your hands and just rest your rounded hand in the palm of the other your hand is like a, a mitt your other hand is like the ball or it's like a egg in an egg cup but if you're not wearing gloves right now, I hope you're not, can you feel the temperature of your right hand, compare it to your left hand? You feel the temperature of your rounded, closed, sort of balled up hand compared to the one that's, that's surrounding it. There's a, a hand that's nestling and nesting in a nest. Is the nest warmer than the egg? Now, now switch, is, switch which is your curled hand and switch which is the hand that surrounds it and just sit here with your hands resting in your lap and is it clearer to you oh yeah that's my warmer hand I mean by a degree or a fraction of a degree or maybe if like me I've got thoracic outlet syndrome some people have will know what that is is one side of me is much colder than the other and I can feel it can you feel a difference in your two hands and then let's go back to leaning resting your head resting the weight of your skull in your arms in your hands once again and now with your eyes probably closed in this moment can you feel the difference in the temperature of your two eyes or is that just a ridiculous thing to ask someone to notice maybe it's not humanly possible to sense such a thing but your fuller, your more generous eyeball, the one that feels maybe that it is hanging, suspended like very ripe fruit on the tree, ready to be picked. Remember when they used to leave fruit hanging on the tree before it would almost drop? It was so juicy. Imagine that eyeball was sinking. You don't have to do anything. There is nothing you can do. Just Imagine the sensation if your eye could hang and sink, 
as if it was going to fall into the hammock of your eyelid, the top and bottom eyelid making a kind of a net. Don't worry, your eye isn't going anywhere. Is this an idea for your eye that is pleasant or it's just unusual that you'll do it or it's plain uncomfortable and you don't wish to, so you shouldn't. Could you try it with the other eye? Maybe the other eye knows how to hang from its socket, suspended. I think of those um, really yoga, aerial yoga, someone hanging from a rope. Could your eye hang from a rope inside, protected by the eye socket? And now let's get to some real movement, not big movement, but your pelvis sitting on this chair is like a basin. It really is like a bowl with a piece missing, a bowl. I have to say that with an American accent or else no one understands bowl in Australian. Tip your bowl a little bit forward and then backward, but very lazily forward and backward. And which direction feels like if you wanted to, you could go a lot further, but you just won't. As you're rocking your pelvis forward and backward. Now do a very Pilates thing and tighten or contract your abdominal wall. Activate your core or cinch in your waist. Maybe you could, as I say in my class, engage your lower abdominals. That's the area of the front the, the surface of the front of your torso below your belly button. Can you pull it in? Like you're wearing pants that are a size too small. You want to do up your top button. Now let it go. Let whatever you were contracting, whatever you were engaging, let it go. And actually be a little more generous and let your belly be full as if a balloon was being expanded inside of it. This is not a sensation that some people really are unhappy about letting their guts hang out. Are you okay to do it? I can't see it. Yeah. <laughs> right. Right. Now, imagine that the basin, which is your actual bony pelvis, really bones, has inside it a larger water balloon that's almost like your organs sitting in a bag. I don't know why they're sitting in a bag, but that bag is a balloon and it's full of water. And you're going to gently, gently, as if all of you was fluid, all your contents was fluid, slosh your bag very slowly forward and then sort of let it splosh and roll a bit backwards. Now, there's a very good likelihood that your pelvis is moving and that's fine. Let your pelvis this rock it's a great way to get the visceral sphere this balloon full of water to get it moving as you're doing it how much is your pelvic imprint the the imprint of your sit bones on the chair how much are they changing now leave your pelvis in a midway place and see if you can still let your internal volume of your tummy pour forth and draw backward very slowly with no physical skeletal movement, no movement of joints. What does that mean? Very subtle. Is it your imagination? Or if I had my hand resting on your tummy, would I feel it expand and billow out? Will I feel it pull back? And as those things might be physically appearing and physically occurring or simply in your imagination. Imagine that your tongue could do this kind of filling, becoming more expansive, broadening, billowing and retreating. Does your belly, does your tongue synchronize? Do they do the same thing at the same time? If they are, Maybe you could switch it when your belly expands and pushes forth, pull your tongue back a little bit, like a deflating balloon inside your mouth and then make your tongue fulsome. Do you feel it all the way up to the back of your throat and down behind your, well, in front of your spine of your neck? 
And then leave that, come and sit tall, sit upright, and simply notice what's in front of you. Is it a screen? I'm sorry. <laughs> but maybe in this moment, sitting upright feels a bit different. And if it does feel strangely easier, that begs the question, is having good posture about having stronger and tighter muscles, which is also a little bit of a conflict we might have if we're doing physical strong strength exercise and um, a, som a somatic practice like the Feldenkrais method. Now let's find out how your squat, I don't mean your real squat, I mean the preparation for a squat, come and rise, which is reversing out of a squat, come and sit down. I will. And if you get all the way to the seat, rise again, yeah. And, and what's different as you go up and down? Because it's these everyday movements that we do over and over again. And this might just be where you're wearing yourself out. So a big focus for the Feldenkrais method is longevity. Like how do you make it so that these lovely joints, soft tissues, muscles will last you the long haul? I have in my family grandparents who one is still in her nine she's 98 so who knows how old she'll be but 95 98 i got a long haul so i hope you do too yes. how is that okay. uh, fa fantastic you know you said something very important like the these quad preparations like every time you you get up from from your workplace those are the ones that add up as as a matter of lifestyle and if you do the math like how many times how many part squats you do a day at least 50 those are 50 squats well done or badly done and not in the terms of yeah good because you tighten the right muscles or etc but in a how well you did them from from an embodied perspective and for me it was like wow this is the first time i get up from from a chair like with this ease after a year like it's it's been one year and two weeks since i uh got my knee cart my my knee meniscus fractured yes. and i was like 14 weeks immobile with with a groin to ankle cast and though I've done my physiotherapy, my Pilates, even my Feldenkrais, <laughs> I am very happy to officially announce <laughs> that this is the first time that I get up from a chair with ease and especially without fear. Yes. And I have the suspicion the that, part. that mm. that fear was like, like also keeping me from, from doing the thing. And... Oh, I absolutely love what, what we did with the, with resting the head in the hands because in a way we made a tour through the perceptive outlets of of the seven yes. senses. Like, yes. like and the eyes, eyes closed and yeah, I I could I could actually feel how my left eye is colder than the right eye. And now I see everything with more resolution. Like, no, I don't want to. I was to wondering that. For some of us, we have our computer sitting here, so we don't get a sense of what uh, the peripheral vision, which is an element of our vision we don't really know or, or have a lot of control over but also the acuity of what we see in our focal which is more in that sort of um the frontal parts of it so i'm really interested in integrating more of the sensory work in a feldenkrais session because it's a very proprioceptive and vestibular heavy kind of practice and i think there's room for more of this visceral which can incorporate many of the other senses. And I think our poor eyes in a modern world when we're just looking at screens so much, even if you're lucky and you get to read from a book, your eyes tire, you know, you drive, your eyes get tired. So we have to recognize that they're all connected. They're all, they're physically connected, but they're neurally connected. The, the nerve cells are connected in this little box 
the top of the box up here inside your brain. So, um, yeah, we, we're including some of that kind of work too in the in the fitness. Can you imagine wondering about your eyes while you're in a exercise class? That's the way it should be, actually. Like mm, yeah. bring forth the whole or you, of yourself into the action that you're performing. So this is this is a seed for that. Yes, yes, more yeah. to come. Yeah, Sonia, how can we know more about what you're doing, your honest exercise approach? Well, you can sample um, a, a short movement lesson if you go to my website, which is honestexercise.me, that's dot M-E. And if you go to that page, there'll be a, a, a button where you can uh, join my newsletter and get a, a weekly short lesson the first one will be a video lesson for those if you're not really familiar with how to follow the instructions which are generally all just a verbal instruction with very little um, demonstration then there's uh, a link that you'll find with this podcast which is a uh, a replay of a workshop that i gave called no fad fit so it's to give you more ideas more tools for working out how to work out in a in a sustainable way, what to be on the lookout for, as well as if you're interested to go that step further, you can join me at um, May 15 is when I'll be launching a two month program where you'll get daily sessions and they will be both Zoom if you happen to be available at 9 a.m. New York City time and uh, recordings as well so you can really begin to make a practice of this and it's very accessible the the main sessions are only 20 minutes so if you don't have 20 minutes to take care of your body you need to reassess your life yes indeed <laughs> you do yes but if you um, have more time you can repeat them and um, that's a real nice progression and way to get you used to really loving and nurturing your body and get making friends with it again Yes, making friends with your body, with the self. Fantastic, Sonia. Thank you for coming to the Essential Sessions podcast. It's a pleasure. I'm so glad you invited me. Yeah, very happy, very happy. And yeah, essentialists, go to honestexercise.me and get subscribed to to get a, a deeper taste of this, this approach that blends together Pilates and Feldenkrais. And if you haven't subscribed already also to the Essential Sessions podcast, come to centraldepoder.com and get yourself signed up. Until next time, remember to sense your fire so you can share the flame. <laughs>